Okay, sure. Thank you. Uh, please, Ga um, Nachi, could you open your camera? Because I want to introduce you. Okay, Nati, um, Gabi, and um, Professor Ivan, Professor Gabriel, and Professor Ivan. This is Natalia. She's our professor assistant of LA International Program, and now she's our host. She she will tell us everything that we sh we should do. So please obey her. <laughs> captain, my captain. Captain, my <laughs> captain. Yes. And she will um, take care of us today and for the whole leap, for the whole leap. Great. Okay. That's a pleasure. Hi. So it's very nice to meet you. Should we start? Um, I, I, we have a lot of people on board. Yes, so we, I think, maybe. I think, yeah, I just wanted to make some introductions. And thank you, Nati, and thank you all for being here. And I'll make some introductions here because, um, okay. So first of all, um, I'd like to really thank uh, Professor Gabriela and Professor Ivor Machea for being here today. Uh, they really have a long, long bio that we are very proud to have them here. Professor Gabriela, for more than 20 years, solving conflicts uh, in companies out, uh, out of the companies. Gabriela is a lawyer, mediator, and constellator. And I think she could tell us a little bit, a, a little bit more about all those experiences. And throughout her career as a legal director, director of institutional relations and ombudsman, she has always applied mediation and dedicated herself to the, to the development of conflict mediation in the most diverse scenarios. So, um, uh, Gabriela, above all, uh, she is a person who I personally, personally know her and I know about her dedication and her love about this path of mediation. Um, she was awarded with uh, advocacy um, uh, in advocacy category and the implementation of mediation at the uh, Bar Association uh, in Brazil. She's a fellow of Weinstein uh, International Foundation that she will mention after. And she currently is the Ombudsman at Petrus uh, from Petrobras. And it's really a pleasure to have her here because Gabriela represents mm, not just the, the, the competent mediators in Brazil, but um, a, a person who is totally engaged and, um, and really wants to make the mediation <coughs> grows in Brazil make a lot of efforts to do that, to, to have that. So thank you very much, Professor Gabriela, for being here today, especially uh, at LEAP, at our Law International Program, and uh, that we are going just to say a few words later. And also, I want to, um, to thank Professor Ivan Machea, which is a specialist in conflict prevention conflict transformation, facilitation and mediation in social environment issues related to extractive family, commercial, labor and labor industries. He's a mediation mediator of the World Bank's Office of Mediation and Facilitation Services and mediator and facilitator for the Compliance Consultants Ombudsman in the independent uh, accountability mechanism of the World Bank's International Finance Corp Corporation and for the, the independent consultation and investigation mechanisms of the Inter-American Development Bank. He is also a senior member of Weinstein International Foundation and served as a secretary of the National Mediation Office of the Peru Peruvian Ministry of Justice and responsible for the implementation of national mandatory mediation system 
uh, and Peru. So again, thank you also, Professor uh, Ivan. I know that uh, Professor, um, um, Professor Gabriela has invited you today, but um, we want to uh, we want you to feel um, totally, totally um, embraced for all of us because we are receiving such a, such an expert and mediator and a person that I'm pretty sure that loves mediation also and will share with us uh, your knowledge, your experiences. Uh, and today it's really a special morning for us. Uh, this event is part of our program, of prog our program in uh, law, uh, international law, uh, which is called Law International Program. And we are doing our first event of this program. And uh, here, we have the space to dialogue. We have this space to have um, people uh, sharing thoughts and to open dialogues and to open um, to uh, ideas to build a new uh, perspective of um, consensual, um, consensual uh, dispute resolutions. So thank you all people that are here in your Saturday morning. We are here in almost 60 person <laughs> um, that we are here to uh, share these moments. And people, please feel free to, to ask them what you, what you have in your mind, your doubts or your thoughts, because we are here to dialogue, okay? We are here to dialogue. Um, I'd like to start asking Professor Gabriela uh, how uh, she met Professor Ivan and this path of both of you in mediation and also in international mediation. Thank you again. The word is yours. And please be very comfortable in this house. Thank you very much. I think the reason and, and, and the, the way we met, Ivan and I, is basically the reason why we are all here. Uh, we both share an international uh, career. Uh, we are both fellows of Weinstein International Fellowship. I was a fellow in 2011. I don't remember the year you were a fellow. What was it? 2018, I think. Okay, yes. so I was first. <laughs> yes, and, uh, always are. <laughs> but it's always, always getting better. Every year it gets better and better. So that's natural. <laughs> and, uh, and that means that we have done something for the development of, our, of mediation in our country. So this fellowship it, uh, brings people from all over the world that have been either pioneers or or in a different way, developers of the mediation uh, profession in their countries. Of course, uh, there are other good people in our countries, but uh, we were lucky to be, meet there. And uh, just to tell a little bit about my story, and then I'll, I'll pass the word to Ivan, because he's the best person to, to let us know about everything he did. Uh, I started uh, my legal career not wanting to fight. I never wanted to fight just because it's a different fight. We are always fighting in life for something we believe in. And I never believed in fight to fight, <laughs> if, uh, making myself understood. My father was an excellent litigation lawyer and I admired him a lot but I also saw the results of litigation and I didn't find it very interesting for anybody involved. Maybe the lawyer, uh, but even the lawyer many times feels that this is not the purpose of life. This is not what we are here to do. Sometimes the fight is inevitable, but in most 
opportunities we have to solve a problem, fight should be uh, the last frontier, the last resort. And, and there's a lot of things we can do before we get there. So getting there means that we were not successful in the other opportunities to solve the problem. Before we have a dispute, we have a problem. And the problem gets uh, ill enough to then get to a point where people, the, the, the parties and their lawyers cannot resolve that directly anymore. So they need the state to intervene. And, and this intervention is always uh, to say who's right and wrong, looking at the past. So that doesn't help the future. It's a, it's a look towards the past. And the past is where the problem happened and we couldn't solve it. So it's a cycle. And to get out of this cycle and build something different for a better future that we are all looking forward to, we need to do something different. And, and that's what I was always searching for. And then I went to the United States in to 1980, 1998, 1998. And I, be, I, I went to a master course at NYU and studying um, civil procedure. I, my, my master was about the comparison between uh, civil, um, the, 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 our, system, um, I just had a blank here and forgot the name, uh, common law and civil law system. That was my master's because at the time, uh, arbitration was starting to get to be known in Brazil. We, our arbitration law is from 96, that was 98. And so we were talking about arbitration a lot, although it was not very used yet because it was uh, in the Supreme Court uh, being discussed as constitutional or unconstitutional for many reasons. And, uh, but in international contracts, in contracts between transnational contracts, between companies of different countries, we were already using a lot of arbitration and very few people knew about it. So I wanted to learn about common law so that I could have a high level discussion with common law lawyers, not like I wanted to be a lawyer in a different country, but I wanted to have this discussion at a good level, especially because in most contracts, we use New York law as the basis for arbitration. So I went to NYU and studying uh, American civil procedure, I read one sentence about mediation. And it was, it is a methodology to co-build solutions that can be accepted by all parties involved. And that was exactly what I was looking for. So I dedicated every energy, every cent, <laughs> and every minute I had to learn about mediation. And, and after my master course, I stayed in New York for a year working as a lawyer in a law firm, a typical New York law firm. And working there, and I did mediation in a multi door courthouse as a volunteer to learn how to do it in practice. But in the office, in the legal, the, the, the legal office where I worked, uh, I had the wonderful chance to shadow mediations at GEMS. GEMS is the, the, the biggest mediation provider in the world. And that's how I met Ivan uh, years afterwards, 20 years afterwards, <laughs> no, 18 years. So I, I uh, as a lawyer working for the law firm where I was working, uh, we went with clients uh, as a legal team to help them in a negotiation that was very, very uh, normally very complex. Uh, so the lawyers went with the clients and it was a chance. I was completely in awe to just see that happening. I felt like a child going for the first time to Disneyland and having dinner with Mickey. 
So <laughs> that's how I felt when I first watch the mediation we, we we use this word shadow because we we are like the the shadow of the mediator so we're just there to look to learn uh, and I, I asked to have this opportunity in many mediations and they were very open uh, and I was very lucky to have that uh, sight of the world that I wanted to live in so when I came back to Brazil in 2000 I started doing everything I could to develop mediation here. At the time, mediation, conciliation, and meditation were exactly the same in the, in the general understanding of the public. So we did everything we, I did and some other people, and then we had more and more people, and now we have the market that we do uh, to develop this, this possibility in the Brazilian legal scenario and also in the scenarios that don't get to be legal because problems are solved before they need a lawyer or they need to go to court. So coming back to Ivan, and then I'll, I'll talk more. Um, being a fellow at, at JAMS, because Weinstein is the person, the, he, he is a, a very senior partner at JAMS, and he put his own money to build opportunities for mediators around the world. So he invites people, oh, we have to apply <laughs> and we work very hard in this application, but then they select some people around the world to not just be with them and have this opportunity to learn from what they do, but also to do whatever we think is necessary for our development, including academic work. So I was, uh, uh, with them, I, I was a, a fellow in 2011, and afterwards I, uh, we have a lot of activities together, and that's how I met Ivan, in an opportunity to to be in Peru, in Lima, with this beautiful view, and I, I really admire his work, but uh, as a mediator, I cannot talk about the parties unless they have uh, expressed what is really important to them. So, leaving the the uh, the speech i pass the word to ivan so that he can talk about his own career in a in a much uh, deeper way than i could ever uh, thank you gabriela thank you so much uh, once again uh, it's a real honor to be here i have to say that uh, i feel extremely comfortable um, being part of this group um, and as i said uh, at the beginning, uh, it's an irony of life that I'm invited to, to talk to Brazilian uh, people, mostly women, as I can see, uh, but speaking English. You know, uh, something interesting is that uh, thanks to my, my colleagues, in, my Brazilian colleagues from uh, this Weinstein Foundation, from the fellows, I happen to learn uh, Portuguese. Brazilian Portuguese during the last 14 months and as things start I started in January last year things have to finish too and I finished uh, the whole course uh, last month so I was expecting to speak some Portuguese here but <laughs> we have this uh, this interesting uh, uh, space in which we have to speak uh, English and that's fine. We'll have, I'm sure, we have some other chances to falar português. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, uh, I have to say something that I will always uh, keep in my mind about Gabriela because we never met in person up until we had that uh, original meeting a couple of years ago. It was actually 2019, I believe, um, yeah. and. Uh, I found out that we have so many things in common because we work with. Uh, we we uh, we do a lot of consensus building work. Uh, she she was, uh, or yeah, she was part of a, of a, an NGO or foundation uh, in charge of doing the, the type of work that I do as well, working with people, dialogues. Uh, social conflicts, uh, conflict prevention, and all that stuff. 
And uh, something that I will remember is that she was one of the few attendees who gave me a very nice present that I really cherished very much during my months of learning Portuguese because it was a, a, a beautiful book about social experiences uh, done by Brazilians. Uh, I think it was in, in mostly in Rio. And all these wonderful people just giving their time for free, just for social services, helping uh, uh, youngsters, uh, kids in, in the favelas, uh, or helping the elder, helping people with um, uh, handicaps and, and all that. Uh, and it was just a great, great inspiration, both to, to learn uh, Portuguese and, and to know how how uh, people can use solidarity, you know, to improve the life of others, especially during last year, which, which was the beginning of the pandemic, you know. So thank you so much, Gabriela. You still have that book always uh, next to me. And uh, what I have to say is that um, um, about how I got into uh, mediation and alternative dispute resolution, is that, uh, well, we have something in common with uh, Gabby as well, because uh, first of all, I was never too happy about becoming a so-called uh, regular lawyer. Uh, uh, maybe this is uh, uh, some sort of bias that I have, but uh, from what I saw uh, of on the culture, on the legal culture here in Peru at least, is that there are some trade of uh, um, overconfidence and arrogance in the way some lawyers behave and how they see life and how they believe things have to be settled or solved. And uh, I never liked that type of uh, point of view. I, I always uh, uh, wonder why uh, do people have to, do some lawyers have to behave that way and have to see the world through, through, through that prisma, you know? Uh, because there are so many ways of doing things, there are many ways to settle disputes uh, and so on. So remember my very last course on, uh, at the law school was on uh, international dispute settlement. And I realized that uh, there was uh, there were other ways to solve disputes, you know, like negotiation, mediation, arbitration, and suddenly the course became very practical. And we, as uh, law students, started to negotiate cases. Uh, I mean, everything was within the the classroom setting, but still, you know, we we got into hands-on experience, uh, doing some negotiation simulations and then mediations. And then I realized, boy, this is something um, that I really enjoy. And then I decided to write a thesis about the Malvinas War. Uh, in English, it would be the Falklands War. I hope there's no Argentinians here. They will kill me, probably. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I decided to write a thesis about that uh, conflict uh, and realized abroad, because at that time I, I happened to, to be in Europe, uh, backpacking and, and getting some information from interesting uh, libraries, uh, especially in Scandinavian countries, that it was a huge field. Uh, dispute resolution and conflict resolution itself was a huge field. And then I said, this is something I want to do for a living. And uh, well, the whole thing started, got into uh, negotiation, mediation. And now what I do is basically uh, work as a mediator for the World Bank. They have uh, what they call uh, workplace disputes. The World Bank work, uh, works uh, as a country. You know, it's an international organization. But uh, if you work for the World Bank, uh, no matter where you are uh, based, and if there is a controversy with the bank, with the bank or with a colleague within the bank, uh, you're not supposed to go to, to the local uh, court system. You have to 
use the dispute resolution mechanisms within the bank. They even have eight types of mechanisms, and one of them is mediation. So I'm one of mediators for that, those uh, types of disputes for four countries, uh, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Bolivia. And I have been doing online dispute resolution for the last 10 years, you know, something that has become mandatory nowadays, but uh, was quite an interesting challenge. Uh, and it, it, it's been working very well. I, I mean, what we have experienced during the last uh, 12 months uh, has been very regular for, for the World Bank. And uh, I really appreciate that type of experience. Uh, I, and at home, what I do a lot is a lot of um, conflict analysis on social conflicts. Uh, there are many disputes in, in Peru or social conflicts more than just disputes between extractive companies, uh, indigenous peoples or, or peasant communities uh, due to mining or due, due to uh, oil. Uh, some of these conflicts have become extremely uh, critical to the uh, democratic system because of, uh, of the level of uh, tension and violence that uh, have reached. So uh, in those cases, uh, I have been working for the last 15 years, uh, sometimes as an analyst, sometimes as a mediator or facilitator, or uh, some sort of um, uh, coach for um, all, all types of parties, uh, sometimes uh, be companies uh, or communities or the state. And uh, thank God I have this law degree, this law background, because whenever I sit in front of a, or sharing the, the, the table with a lawyer, I know, I know how they think. Um, and it's much easier, you know, to get uh, into their minds and to understand their point of views, and also to show them that there are other ways of, of, of settling disputes. Um, and now, uh, you know, since I, I always try to get into the innovation uh, dimension as well, um, I'm very much uh, trying to foster what I call online dispute resolution, doing mediation through Zoom or any other digital platform. And also, um, I have a, a master's degree in gender studies because I really uh, uh, I was very much interested in understanding why, especially men, why men behave the way they behave in conflicts. You know, it's the type of conflicts that I, that I manage or that I intervene in, uh, the, the, these social conflicts I talked to you about, you know, are basically men, you know, of all, t of all walks of life um, interacting in their own personal and cultural ways. And uh, having this gender perspective uh, has helped me to understand their masculinities and, and you know, strategize about how, how to improve my, my practice. And just to something interesting, you know, talking about gender and, and dispute resolution, uh, you realize many of the of the traits of the dispute resolution, especially mediation field, is related to feminine traits. You know, good listening, uh, problem solving, uh, uh, patience, uh, and it's interesting that most of the attendees to this uh, talk are women as well. <laughs> so there is something you know that uh, that perspective also can tell us about. Uh, mediation and dispute resolution. Anyway, I'll stop here. I feel that Lou wants to talk. Uh, can I just make one comment, Lou? Uh, it's very interesting, Ivan, and, and many international friends that I have that have been uh, participating in international events with Brazilian mediators notice exactly what you did in one second, uh, that we are mostly women. And around and, and talking here to the to our uh, participants, uh, Brazil is a country where most mediators are women. 
uh, it is the very opposite of what happens in most of the world. And my thoughts about it, of course, I don't have a scientific explanation for that, but I, I feel that what Brazil needs to add to the world, what Brazil has to offer in terms of adding value to the world is this um, feminine uh, aspects of sensibility, of uh, uh, caring and, and being gentle. Not like we are great uh, uh, angels, not at all, Brazilians in general, uh, <laughs> but we have this um, characteristic. And, and in Brazil also, uh, the mediation market started through family, mostly family issues. So that also brings more women to the scenario. And what I really believe in is that our destination, our natural evolution is to the balance between masculine and feminine uh, abilities. So it's not about being a man or a woman, mm -hmm. but about developing abilities in both uh, paths, in both uh, uh, logics. It's basically about a logic. And what we need is to respect the both uh, the two uh, lenses to to see the world through, and Brazil does that very well. So that's why uh, the mediation market in Brazil only tends to grow. So and, and also export. <laughs> we, we really we really hope to see that because I was with Fernanda Levy. Uh, in a few minutes ago and she was really saying that sometimes we we look um we look to the future and we look to the other examples and we see oh how far we are from um a, a very developed market a very a very developed a very developed um mediation path but she said okay let, let's look back and see from where we came so yes we we did a, a, a really nice progress in our mediation path and yesterday i was i was uh, doing a um a, a course a program in uh, nbc nonviolent communication and in the end of the the class of yesterday she said something about uh, 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 a person who said about th those kind of tools like NVC or even mediation. And he said, what we need to learn is about, I don't know really exactly the, the word in, uh, in English because I would say motherhood, but he said in Portuguese, he said in Portuguese something about uh, maternagem, which is not really motherhood, but it's something related to and has to do with exactly what uh, Gabriela is saying. Uh, it doesn't have nothing to do with um, with men or women, but has to do with care of the other people. So um, the beauty of those kinds of methods, it's totally the possibility of caring the other. So this is really uh, why this this Path, this path is so is so deep Magic. I would say very deep because we take care of the others and yes we share <laughs> I think everybody that is here shares those um, those feelings about this market but I would start with a question uh of a million dollars which is how can we nah, uh, we that are in this path but especially you that have an international view of mediation dispute consensual dispute resolution how can we aware uh, rise uh, rise awareness about uh, for uh, among lawyers and um parties about these consensual methods, uh, trying 
obviously to look um, through the international lens, but also so trying to understand our peculiarities, our characteristics, our culture, how can we could raise awareness about those methods, consensual methods for people of the- Can, can I start? <laughs> There's so much to be said, but I'll try to be short so that we leave off as a chance because one of the characteristics of women is to talk more than men. Uh, and we need to balance that. Uh, we need to respect the space for both. Uh, so I'm very conscious about it. Not like I, uh, I'm a master at it. <laughs> so I have a husband that doesn't need to talk a lot. So it's a perfect match. Um, but I know that other men want to talk. So <laughs> no, but uh, building from what we just said, and I think that is very important. I, I really believe in this perfect match that we are heading to, but we're not there yet anywhere in the world of bringing masculine and feminine abilities together. And, and this is the, the magic of sustainable solutions anywhere. We need the, the care of the mother, but we also need the uh, develop yourself of the father. Like the mother uh, nourishes and, and and protects the baby but at some point the child needs the father to say you go there to the world and you uh, solve your own problems i'll be here but only after you have tried so this is very important because otherwise and this is a characteristic in brazil we 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 become adults still dependent on somebody else and mediation is about taking responsibility for the decisions, whatever they are. So if you, in mediation, we enable people, we empower people to be the owners of their own destinies, to be the developers of whatever will affect their lives. And this is a father aspect. This is a male aspect that we also need very much. So the mix is the, is the the destiny, the solution, the, the purpose of life. But so how do we convince lawyers? The legal world is very masculine and we need to use their arguments. Otherwise they just, it, it's just something that doesn't connect to them. So we cannot start a, a mediation saying, well, dear parties, you were until a moment ago, you were, willing to kill each other and now please hold hands and hug each other and everything will be fine it doesn't happen this way people are not uh i would say on earth we are not in a spiritual level yet to just tell people well a consensual solution is better for you than the fight because the fight will make you spend a lot of of money a lot of time a lot of energy and it will take you to a place that is worse than what you came from so that is very naive and many mediators uh try to do that over and over again wishing for a different result and of course not getting it so uh in the legal field we need to say what the people understand and it's not better or worse it's just their way and we need to respect their way. So I have a, a very interesting uh, story about it. Uh, when I was a fellow with GEMS, I was in New York uh, interviewing many people about how the, develop, the, the, the commercial mediation market developed in the United States. And I had the opportunity to talk to a very good lawyer, a, a top senior partner in a top law firm. And I asked him, uh, he was one of the pioneers to take cases to mediation. So at the beginnings of the 70s, he was already taking clients to mediations as a lawyer. So accompanying clients in mediations. And I asked him why he started, what made the difference in his practice from pure litigation to mediation practice. And he said, uh, 
I didn't go to mediation because I want people to hug each other. I didn't go to mediation because I was concerned about uh, feeling good uh, with my own self. I lived the moment of an extreme uh, economic crisis, by the way, just like we're going through in the whole world right now. And I knew that in order to survive, I needed to offer my client a path, a solution that was more intelligent than what the other law firm was offering, full stop. So mediation is not just about hugging each other. It's not just about uh, going to bed and being able to sleep uh, in peace, but it's also about the best solution to the real problem of the parties. And once we understand that, we can uh, say the same thing is exactly clear and objective. Uh, we can say the same thing in a very male vocabulary because people, everybody understands the need to survive, the need to compete, the need to make money, the need to be sustainable. And that's what mediation is about. We can also talk about the need to uh, do to others what you would have done uh, onto you. Uh, you can also talk about uh, the, the need to not destroy relationships because it took long to build them and it's very easy to destroy them. So there are many reasons, but we need to talk in the vocabulary that your, in, uh, your counterpart can understand. Sorry, Ivan, <laughs> go ahead. No, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you so much. It's, it's always good to... It's a joy really listening to you, Gabriela, no, no problem. Um, uh, this question about how to, well, maybe I'm framing the, the question in, the, in a different way, but what I understood of the question is uh, how, how to convince you know, the legal community and, uh, and the community itself about the, the advantages of mediation and dispute alternative dispute resolution um you know this this question i've been hearing this question for uh, well boy i'm aging for three decades already um, how do we improve uh, the number the rate of uh, mediation mediation settlements uh why do people still and why do lawyers prefer uh, to take cases to to court, uh, why is there such a resistance? You know, when we talk about mediation and uh, some people are not interested, especially from the legal community. And, and you know, what, what I see is that there are like, uh, like two ways of explaining this or two, two sides. The first side is uh, related to to making some, some changes, uh, to create new meanings to how we do things, you know. What's the idea of doing justice? Doing justice is just taking a case uh, before a judge into a law court. Uh, is that the way how we do justice or we help justice? We help our, our clients. And I believe we can do much more. Uh, uh, I believe, for instance, that uh, all clients should have the right to know uh, before going to court that they have other ways of solving their disputes, you know, by using negotiation. And uh, if that fails, you can go into mediation. If that fails, well, depending on the case, on the nature of the matter, you may take that into arbitration and, and probably that would be the end of it. And if it's not possible, well, you go to court. So, uh, and that's a, a typical practice that you don't see in lawyers. I mean, if they had this kind of uh, medical way of treating the client saying, well, you have this, you know, your conflict, is, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do some sort of analogy with a, with a medical profession, you know, they try to diagnose what kind of uh, sickness or medical or situation you have, and then they give you like different treatments, you know, 
Well, that type of practice, I don't see that very, very often in, in our colleagues. And that should, that should change. Also, uh, create a new meaning to uh, the idea of uh, what is success for a lawyer. Success is uh, all the cases that you win. Um, it's like marking the wall, you know, with all these sticks, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, I'm the winner. Uh, becoming like the devil's advocate that you, that you made a promise uh, that you will never lose. You become a winner. Uh, and I think you have to change that meaning as well. You have to reframe that. Uh, in Spanish, and I think also in Portuguese, we say resignificar. To, to create a new meaning, you know, to those words. And also uh, the idea of how to make money, because it is true that if you take a case uh, to a law court, probably you will charge more money in the long run uh, for the handling of the case. But what I have to say, you know, um, uh, to argue against that idea is that depend, it depends on how, how much you value your work as a mediator or as a, or as a dispute resolution specialist. And you can create ways of uh, making decent and good money by uh, applying your practice. And the other dimension is related to the structural causes. Uh, here in Peru, for instance, uh, I don't see that uh, that the judicial system or the legal system is uh, or is yeah is set to uh, or has been established in order to foster the use of mediation. Why? Because you don't have predictable uh, court decisions. Uh, second, you have the problem of corruption. Uh, and suddenly you have all these lawyers that can uh, illegal, illegally practice law to get the results. So it's not like in the United States in which you have legal decisions that are binding, uh, that the court system is very much predictable. And before going to court, you more or less know and your lawyer will tell you, well, you know, this type of case, probably you have 40 to 60% or 70% of winning, losing, and then you make, make a decision decision in our legal system is that's not the case so why is only in peru that doesn't happen in brazil no well <laughs> <laughs> i've been watching the news during the last year and I know that, Gabriela. <laughs> the brazilian news i know <laughs> we wish <laughs> yeah yeah uh well we we have something in common you know so those many things <laughs> those things uh those things are not very very encouraging to the field and uh, despite the fact that you have a lot of training, every year you have more, more lawyers and uh, train either uh, on their law schools or in other uh, settings, you know, with uh, courses uh, on ADR, on arbitration, on mediation. Um, there's a lot to do. And I think we have to kind of pinpoint all the, all the places in which we have to focus our energy to, to make those changes. You know, Ivan, um, of course, we have a lot in common, much more than we would like to <laughs> in terms of legal system. Uh, but I, I think it's interesting as well to understand for the development of the mediation market, it's very uh, necessary to understand how we get to court. So one of the reasons why the mediation market was so developed in the United States before anywhere else in the world is the cost to get into the judiciary system. So it costs a lot to start a legal suit. So that comes back to, to the, the explanation of the lawyer I just mentioned. Uh, how do I offer something to my client that is clearly better than what the other law firm is offering uh, starts by the cost of starting a lawsuit. Just the expectation of a lawsuit in the United States may uh, uh, bankrupt a corporation. 
because it's expensive to get into the judiciary. So there's a barrier there, clear barrier, and it's expensive to go through the, the, the case because the production of evidence is so expensive. And the more one side uh, pro uh, produces, the more the other side needs to, to produce as well. And so it's expensive to fight. In Brazil, and I, I'm pretty sure in Peru, maybe a little different, but basically the big numbers are the same. It's cheap to get into the judiciary. In Brazil, uh, when we, we worked on uh, access to justice, we mixed the, 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 the concept and we, uh, as a country, we understood it was free justice. But just the, it is an irony and a, a, a new topi because there's nothing free. Somebody's paying. And who is paying is the whole society. So it, it's, you don't pay anything directly to get into court. So everybody goes to court. And then the court just cannot deal with so much. And on the other hand, we have a, uh, another aspect that is very important to understand. Uh, and in that aspect, I'm sure we're not like Peru, we're much worse. Uh, Brazil has more law schools than the rest of the world together. So we, as one country, have more law, firm, law, law schools than the planet altogether. So we need to make room for so many lawyers to make some money and honor the profession. So how do we do that? Inflating the courts. But then, so then we, we come back to the equation and it's cheap to get into court, but it's very expensive to get out of it. But we don't take that into account when we are making the decision to go to court or not. Because we don't, we as the people, as the, the society, we don't know that. We will only know once we are already there and our cost to be in court is already paid for. We, we have already disimbursed a lot. So the more we have paid, the more we think, well, I have paid so much. So let's go just a little further and a little further to see if I make my investment worth. And it will never be worth. Not just for the money, which is the, the most objective criteria, but for the, the rest of the costs that we cannot uh, translate into money, but it, it costs in the soul <laughs> and in the relationship. I'd like so to add. It's necessary to bring that into light. No, sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, me, but I just <laughs> like, I wanted to add that the cost of judiciary uh, that was announced last year was 100 billion reais. Um, uh, this cost was supported 90% uh, by the state it means by us just 10 percent comes from the taxes of being in the judiciary so this is this is something that it's unbearable and obviously it won't take us it won't lead us in in a good in a good place so yeah we have to to find we have really to find another path and other possibilities but doing that i would say could be a possibility to have this, to have those trainings of mediation advocacy. I mean, talk to, not just for the freshmen, for the students in law school, because this is, I think this is totally, um, totally mandatory for law school, but also for mid-career, for people who are still in, in their path, but should we? Talk about the mediation advocacy training. Okay. Um, I, well, uh, if we talk about training uh, in, in law school, uh, I have to remember something that has been, uh, or I would say mm, has been done in a way to foster the knowledge of other means of dispute resolutions besides just litigation. Um, in some law schools here in Peru, for instance, 
right from the uh, first year, the freshman, or the first semester or first year, yes, uh, of law school, you have at least one course called um, Theories of Conflict, uh, in which you are introduced to, to the field of alternative dispute resolution and to understand that conflicts should not be only seen through the lens of uh, litigation or th through the lens of just uh, rights-based uh, mechanisms to solve a dispute. Um, and I think that's a good point to start with. But then later on, what I don't see is how you can uh, have a broader view of the other mechanisms. There's always uh, a very, uh, uh, an emphasis, it's a very strong emphasis on uh, procedure law, uh, on litigation techniques, but not as much as on negotiation or mediation or in arbitration. Those are basically what we call elective courses. Those are not mandatory courses. So what you're creating, you're still trying to open, you know, the field, the, I mean, the legal field into something. Uh, it's not, I shouldn't say new because, you know, these ways of solving disputes have been with us always, you know, uh, all societies have started doing mediation right from the, before the, the before the lawyers uh, started as a profession or before having judges and all that, you know, uh, all societies right from the beginning, they started to talk first to solve disputes. Maybe we, uh, the, the ones leading these discussions were the elder or mo the most respectable person, uh, whatever criteria that was valued within that society. But then the lawyers and the judicial system came you know, that, that's, a, that's a kind of a new sort of institution. I don't know, 200, 300 years, or maybe a bit more. I mean, from a democratic uh, sense of the word. Um, so going back into law school, I think uh, we still have to make that, that big, uh, uh, jump into, into seeing conflicts in, from a different perspective and create, create uh, a culture in which the lawyer should be the one discussing with the client what is the best means to treat your dispute. Um, in, my, in my previous uh, intervention, I said that we should have this kind of medical perspective on, on the disputes that are brought before us as lawyers. It's just like, and this medical perspective should be also understanding what's the psychological situation of your client? What's the economical, social situation of your client. Do you have enough money to pay for litigation or for arbitration? Maybe you don't, okay. Maybe we should try then the other means which are much more uh, or much cheaper, so to speak. I'm just uh, um, brainstorming here. Uh, are you comfortable with the idea of a three, four year litigation because this case has this special trait? You know, some cases have to be taken to court. I'm not saying that that courses shouldn't, no, some of them must. Why? Because you want to create some sort of policy or change policy, for instance. Okay, fine, but uh, we're clear on that, but that means money, that means uh, a lot of psychological tension, blah, 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 etc. cetera. Uh, up, until we have, we, up until we don't have that type of uh, uh, legal handling of, handling of disputes, I think we're going to have constantly this type of discussions about how to improve the dispute resolution field and some resistance as well. So uh, uh, I don't want to, to bring despair here <laughs> into the discussion. I always uh, have hope uh, uh, next to me, 
And what I would say is that we have to persevere. Uh, I see good changes. I mean, you're trying to change a culture that has been there, the litigation culture that has been there since the, the beginning of the judicial system. And suddenly, you know, during the last 30 years, uh, we're going back to our roots. And our roots is just basically sitting and, and talking what we're doing here. We don't need lawyers to talk well, probably all, all of us are lawyers here, but we don't need to have a law degree to discuss and reach, uh, reach consensus. So we, it's like going back, you know, it's like interesting. It's, it's like a kind of movement uh, from the 80s and 90s uh, in which, uh, again, we are going back into the roots of nature, for instance, of, of uh, using natural medicine, uh, preserving uh, uh, mother nature and all that and suddenly we're going back also into the roots of uh, giving a special value to our words uh, to the, the moments of uh, getting together and, and sharing and talking and listening so our basic ba very basic skills you know uh, we shouldn't be uh, trained to, to be decent listeners or, or people who can talk and, and problem solve things. But, you know, that's, again, that's an irony of life, you know, uh, of the profession as well. Okay, thank you very much, Ivan. Yeah, we share all those thoughts. We do have problems that are all over uh, the same. Okay, so uh, Gabby, in order for you to, to, to talk about those issues, we do have three questions that are very connected with everything we are, uh, we are talking, which is from Runa. She's, uh, she's asking the opinion of peer mediation in schools, which means the trainings also, and how to start a mediation, international mediation path from Natalia Alves and Fabiola is asking about um, uh, lawyers having the opportunity to, to be cooperative and, and make the earnings increase and things like that. And for the last question, what advice do you give to those, to those who are starting out and want to work in mediation international negotiation? And, um, mediation and modern diplom diplomacy, and I think we are almost in the same in the same um, opportunity to talk about trainings and the career of mediation. Okay, I'll address all the questions in one one uh, train of thought, or except the how to develop. The, the career internationally, which will be a next chapter. So, and this is exactly what I wanted to, to add to Yvonne. Uh, many times, mankind believes that we control our lives and we control nature and we control other species, which more and more is getting clear that we do not. It's an utopia, it's an illusion. Uh, we live a life that leads us to where we need to go. And many times, once we resist, because we have this option, we also have uh, the free will to resist what nature is telling us. Uh, but sooner or later, we will understand that what needs to be seen will be seen inevitably. And when we talk about mediation, we're not only talking about being a mediator in the uh, stricto sensu. We're talking about learning uh, a toolbox, learning uh, how to intervene in different situations where we are negotiators and we are negotiators 100% of the day and seven days a week. Uh, and also, uh, when we are interveners in somebody else's conflict. And we do that all the time, conscious or not. So mediation is not just about one profession. 
is about doing whatever you do in all the professions in a way that builds solution instead of worsening the fight. Many times when we intervene in, in conflicts, uh, the, the parties involved are not ready to look to a solution. So it, it's just like the diseases. I love this kind of uh, uh, analogy as well. And many times I say that conflict is a cancer in the relational body. So uh, I am, let's say, nah? I am here and Luciana is here. Luciana, of course, has more light than I do because <laughs> of the color. <laughs> and we are fighting or we're building something together. We're building a trend together. We are building a relationship together and we are building a conflict together. In order to build the solution, we need to have a clear view of what is not working in our relationship. And that takes time. So many times the conflict takes time to, to show what he's there for. The conflict many times is a good thing because it shows us what is out of place. And before we, we get to building the right solution, we need to get to the right view of what the conflict is trying to tell us that is out of place. So the timing is fundamental. The timing is absolutely necessary for the parties to be ready for a solution. So trying to solve a conflict before the parties have had enough of it won't result in anything. Many times uh, it won't be a waste of time. It will be one more brick in our construction uh, but we will still need more of it in order to build the house we're building together and it's a house of relationship and the the conflict is happening here between the green and the white the conflict is not here and it's not here it's between the parties so when we are uh, intervening in somebody else's conflict we need to ask the question, are you ready to look at it? Are you ready to really absorb what, it, what this phenomenon is telling you? And if the parties are not ready, there's no mediation, there's no miracle that will get them from the conflict mode to the solution mode. We need to respect that. And, uh, but the thing is, if we have that notion, if we, if we respect conflict as a, a, a messenger that is bringing us a necessary message, even if the message is not uh, sweet, uh, but we have to look at it, then we can heal the relationship like a doctor would. So uh, if conflict is a cancer in the relational body, this in between, how do we approach the cancer? It's not just killing everything that is around, like some therapies do. If we don't get to the cause, we will not heal the patient because many that tumor will be gone, but other tumors or other kinds of diseases will explode around it. So we need to, help, to heal the party. And how do we do that? Of course, at some point, they lose ability to do it by themselves, which would be ideal. So if we have the tools within ourselves, and that is what we do in school mediation, when we teach mediation in schools, and I've had that uh, in my career, when I worked with an NGO that is also global, uh, what we did in Brazil was to, to help children in armed conflict zones. So in favelas, in areas where armed conflict was a basic reality every day. So we helped children help other children in conflict. And once children learn that, it becomes much easier for them to include that in their view of life. So they become mediators wherever they go, not just in the fight, not just in school, but they become 
problem solvers in a collaborative way throughout their lives. And most of all, they go from being a victim to being a decision maker of what happens in their lives. And this is the most important thing we can do for a human being. Help them get out of the victim speech. Being a victim doesn't solve problems. Being a victim creates problem because the problem is what feed, feeds the victim. So in order to get out of that cycle and helping people become responsible for their lives, we help them become mediators in whatever they do. Because the main characteristic of a mediator is someone who is there to help people get out of complaining and into problem solving mode become uh, really uh, the, the, the decision makers of their own lives and understanding that they won't solve anybody else's problem, but they have to solve their own problem in order to relate to the other person. So uh, if we understand that mediation is not just for legal suits, mediation is for life as it is, for looking at life as it is, embracing the problems that lives brings so that we can grow and uh so that is an answer for for most of the questions at least my, my part and anyone uh will add uh but then i would just like to to answer about the international career uh whatever career we need to have in mediation uh, if you want to become a commercial mediator, if you want to become a family mediator, if you want to become a mediator in prisons, if you want to become an international mediator, you first need to be someone that this market looks at as someone legitimate and trustable, trustworthy. So uh, becoming a mediator in an international scenario starts by becoming a member of the international scenario. And then you become a mediator and you add mediation to what you can already do. Of course, uh, you can have some um, fast track by working with subjects that are already related to conflict resolution in the international scenario. But how to get there is the same way that you would get anywhere. You first become uh, a trainee, even if you are a senior professional in other area, but first you become uh, acquainted to that environment. And then you develop through the opportunities that that will bring to you. There's no, I don't see any other way. So. All right. Um, I've been listening with a lot of attention to, to Gabriela and some ideas has had a spark into my mind. Um, and what I, what I would start, uh, I would like to start uh, saying is that, uh, I mean, mediation has grown into a huge field during the last 30 years. Uh, 30 years ago, or maybe 40 years ago, uh, you would think of a mediator as a person who, you know, would help you solve your conflicts. And some of them were lawyers, some of them were community mediators, people who really were uh, interested, in, interested in helping people, not necessarily charging for a fee, but just uh, committed to uh, access to justice, to help the others. Um, now you have all sorts of mediators. You have, uh, well, you have international, you have the national, you have the organizational, you have the, the family, the commercial, the consumer, the construction mediator, and so on. Uh, and that opened the uh, field uh, also to training, um, to also develop skills that are really very good to apply in other settings. You know, for instance, I, uh, um, I understand that Gabriela is uh, Ovidora, huh? 
which is a, a an ombudswoman. Uh, ombudsman. Well, ombudsman is, is, is uh, unisex. <laughs> okay, okay, fine, no problem, no problem. That's a Swedish word anyway. But um, um, so because she developed the skills, you know, from mediation, and she can also, uh, and we can also do uh, negotiation as well. There's a discussion about if a good me a negotiator could be a good mediator and, and, and so forth. But I mean, that's, that's another discussion, but still we have the skills because they're very, very related. So when you think about <clears throat> uh, becoming an international mediator and how to begin or improve your practice, I would say uh, I would go along uh, with uh, Gabriela's ideas, start nationally. I mean, that, that should be your starting point. Don't, don't be already concerned about be, becoming international. Just start doing things at home, you know? Uh, get into networks of mediators. Uh, uh, maybe there is uh, some sort of uh, assistant uh, teaching at any law school. Um, and, and try to always uh, get more knowledge by reading, studying, uh, get some training. You can go abroad as well. You know, I, I got all my training during the, the beginning of the 1990s. At that time, I was so lucky that I got uh, scholarships, you know, from, I remember from the Swedish government, from the Norwegian government, and even from the United Nations, you know, to train uh, people in, in mediation and conflict resolution. And uh, I have to say that I was really lucky uh, because, uh, you know, those, nowadays uh, all of those trainings uh, or most of the trainings, uh, you know, cost. But anyway, you always have to be, you know, looking and being updated about what's offered there. And uh, I will tell you maybe a tip, a jika. Uh, like uh, you guys say, <laughs> is always try to write people that you consider inspiring. And if you don't have the money or the, the means of getting there to get training, well, ask for their help. Maybe they can help you, give you a scholarship. But, you know, the bottom line is the, the, the passion that you feel for, for, for this field. I mean, if you have the passion, you're going to find your way. You're going to find your way sooner or later. And you have to persevere, you have to uh, practice, uh, study, always look around, uh, networking. And little by little, you, you'll find, you find the right spot, you know? I have to say that I was lucky because I was probably one of the beginners of, of this, this field in, in my country. Uh, which means that I'm not that young anymore, but I'm not that old either. <laughs> but uh, I mean, if you are passionate enough, you're going to, to reach what you want. And um, I believe that uh, also going into the other subject of, of the types of different types of mediation, a good way of uh, developing uh, this field in a, in a broader base is peer mediation at schools. You know, we've done it here in Peru. The idea is that the uh, uh, secretary of education of, uh, of the whole country sees this as a, as a good policy and implements it uh, uh, throughout the country. I mean, that's a, quite a challenge, but little by little, I think uh, you can you can try this in, as this can be an, an interesting opportunity to, to find your spot, your practice. Uh, you can do likewise in other fields. So my, my idea is just uh, asking you the, this question, are you committed or passionate enough to start uh, uh, getting into this? If the answer is yes, well, you have more than 50% chances that you're gonna get where you want to get. 
even at the beginning of my career and then at the middle and then at the present. <laughs> um, many times people ask, oh, why did you go in this direction? And my very sincere answer has always been, I didn't choose, I was chosen. I, I never saw a different way to do what I needed to do in the world. I don't really, uh, if I could choose, if I could, as a hypothesis that I don't believe in, uh, I would work with mergers and acquisitions, with uh, um, stock markets or something like that. My life would be a lot easier. <laughs> Probably. Uh, <laughs> in a way, in a, easier in, in a, I mean, in some way, because it's, it's a path that is already ready. It's already there. Mm -hmm. uh, starting, and, and of course, we need to, to have clear here that Yvonne and I were uh, the very uh, starting points in our countries. So 20 years ago, nobody talked about mediation in Brazil, and it was very hard to live from it. So many people ask me if I lived, uh, if I made a living out of mediation. And my answer was, I live for mediation, not from mediation at that moment, which I really don't think is very healthy. But now it's completely different. Now we have a market, starting market, not an ideal market, but it's a market. So people at least know what it is about, even when they have a, a different idea than we would like them to have, but at least they've heard about it. But in, in any way, uh, so I, I use our experiences and also Luciana that has been there for a long time uh, as examples of something that um, it's just bigger than us. It, it, it just brings us, instead of us going there on a conscious basis, it's just something that is inevitable because our, our, our life drives us there. Mm -hmm. and, and if you feel this calling, you, you will get there somehow. You'll find your way. And I think that's mm -hmm. what Ivan was saying. If it's really deeply rooted in, in your soul, in your uh, uh, way of looking at the world, you will make it. Otherwise, you won't, and that's okay. Many times you will just use it as a, as a toolbox to do other things out of it. And this is also very useful. And this is also necessary. And this is also very noble. Uh, and it won't be for everyone, and that's okay. But it's useful for everyone. Yeah, and uh, along that line, just uh, I want to steal one minute, uh, Luciana. Um, Think that, think that uh, if you have those skills uh, very clear in your mind, if you can apply it, believe me, you're going to be much more successful uh, compared to the people who don't have a clue about that or who are kind of messy on relating to the other because these are basic skills on how to relate in the best possible way. Uh, so you can be... Uh, you may not become a mediator, but still have the skills that will open up so many possibilities in, in the development of your career. So you have something there to, to take professionally, but also personally, because it helps also in, in personal relationships. Yeah, yeah. You know, you two guys and you all that are here, since the beginning and the ones that had to go away. We just need, first of all, to thank, uh, but also to say that, yes, just like um, Gabriela said, life drives us to this path. You don't, she said, if I, if I could choose, I think it's not a matter of choose. We have, we have, we have this, this call and we cannot choose, we, we have to do it. We have to do it because it's another conscience. It's another way of doing this. It's another, it's another world. It's another world. 
So we started here talking about talking about market we and we end up talking about life, talking about passion and talking about in the bottom of, bottom of the line talking about love and it's just what counts but don't don't be so um um i would say in a hurry to think okay they are just hugging trees no we are here to talk about important things that takes uh, um, a lot of our attention and we have to work on them to make it happen so we are here to say yes we are totally engaged but also we have a lot of work to do and that's why we have two professionals outstanding professionals here that dedicated their lives their career to this ideal and also to this mission because i i understand that like a mission but they have very solid careers they have very very um very engaged and committed careers for their uh, institutions and groups and corporations but they also um they also understand deeply that the 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 the, the end of the, everything is to take care of the others and thank you i'd like again to thank ivan and gabriella for those moments and all people that are here uh hearing us and to say yes whoever uh, needs to to talk a little bit more with them i think they are very um um, um they permit that we have we can make these connections and also professor Gabriela will be with us next Saturday in our law international program in the first class of our law international program you have this this gift to have her as a professor in your first um, in your first course of the law international program and I want also <laughs> and I want also to to thank Professor Ivan for his participation in our program and invite and you are already invited to other participations in our program. Uh, of course it is. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much, Natalia, who was helping her uh, uh, us here and all people that uh, dedicated their time, their Saturday morning to this important dialogue and, and learnings, I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. A kiss all. for everyone. Have a thank wonderful so week. Thank you so much. Thank oh you so God. much, Hi. everybody. Great to see you, Ivan. Yeah, great to see you, Gabriela. Meu prazer. Thank you very much. Seja bem-vindo ao Brasil. O Brasil está no meu coração. Ai, que lindo! Eu tenho um coração brasileiro. Então, que bom, que lindo! Sim, eu assim que tudo isso passar, fiquei estaremos juntos. Fiquei apaixonado com a cultura brasileira e com o sotaque, os sotaques brasileiros. Mas ele fala bem português. A gente Muito bem, português. ele fala fluente português. Estou tentando, tentando. A ele gente que... faz uma live com ele falando em português. Ok. É tá? que esse programa, ele é 100% em in inglês, então so we had to do it. Mas a gente pode fazer uma outra, outra oportunidade em ah, português, sem dúvida. Seria Será um prazer. Perfeito. Seria perfeito, um grande prazer. Que Maravilha. bacana, ele fala bem mesmo. É bem Olha mesmo. só. <risos> Gabi, linda, Deus te abençoe. Deus abençoe a todos. A todos nós. Beijo. A todos nós. Beijo bem grande. Tá. Fiquem com Deus. Muito obrigado. Tchau, tchau. Obrigado. Tchau, tchau.